I hit click. There we go. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Askinas. I'll be the host uh, for this webinar on robotic perimeter security. Today, we'll cover off not just the technology, and it's a really cool technology. Anyone who's been following Boston Dynamics uh, and the Spot Robot, um, thrilled to say that that is one of the core technologies we'll be discussing. So, but beyond the technology, we'll also cover the economics of the employment of this uh, solution from Acelon. And uh, we'll provide essentially the business case for uh, using this service. So uh, in the bottom line, uh, keep people safe and or critical infrastructure safe as well. So as I mentioned, I am the host. I'll be joined by Michael Lichko, who's vice president. Um, when um, I turn the mic over to him, I'll allow himself to uh, introduce his company and his background for me. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of people from the nuclear industry, uh, and for those of you who have a background in the U.S. Navy, I want to say give a big shout out to shipmates. My background includes two and a half years of service, U.S. Navy, uh, on board an SSN, but it's an old skipjack class, which kind of dates me. So also spent uh, a number of years in sales of asset management and reliability solutions to the utilities industry, and exciting right now to be part of Surtrek and exciting to be part of the partnership um, with Acelon Robotics. So uh, we'll do a little bit of background tracks here. Uh, we'll get the companies introduced. And then, as I mentioned, I'll turn it over to Michael uh, for the sort of core discussion today. And we'll have some concluding comments. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are certain that there will be a, a number of questions and we can handle them in a couple of ways. Uh, if you'd like to, please enter them in the chat window. Uh, which is on the bottom of your screen uh, as as they occur. And we'll try and cover them myself uh, or Ryan or others. We'll try and answer them uh, as they come up live. And if we don't, then we have uh, Brandon, who is in the background. He will serve as our Q&A MC at the end of the conversation, and we'll uh, address them live. So, uh, and feel free to, you know, as they pop up, put them in chat and we'll We'll take a dive and, and do our best to answer them. So a little bit about Surtrek. Uh, a lot of you are our customers already, and we appreciate you being here. For those of you who are new to Surtrek, our mission is help utilities be more reliable and secure for a safer grid and bulk electrical system. The way we do that is with uh, SaaS applications and other technology, and uh, with Acelon, the strategic partnerships to help reduce the risk of regulatory non-compliance for utilities and energy companies. And there we go. So our focus areas as a company, obviously compliance uh, with SaaS. Ooh, that was quick, let me go back. That was delayed reaction. Through uh, SaaS application and services for digitization, we hold a number of webinars that highlight our partnership with Fisher Block. And if you have not attended them, uh, we have we do have them recorded on our site, but they've got a really cool asset monitoring technology that uh, is very uh, applicable for wind, for solar. And I'm thrilled to say we have an SMR company who will be engineering that solution into their monitoring infrastructure. So that's exciting stuff. And then uh, cybersecurity as well is now through our strategic partnership with Acelon uh, Physical Security. And you'll learn a lot about that today. So um, our regulatory compliance uh, and is deployed in SaaS applications. For those of you in the nuclear industry, uh, we have a really cool application, the Fatigue Rule Management System. And we're excited to report that TVA will be standardizing on that. But it also includes compliance action tracking systems and an entire suite of uh, compliance and regulatory monitoring type uh, applications and services. Uh, I have it highlighted that we do have contracts with all U.S. nuclear facilities. So for our nuclear customers, a big shout out and thanks for coming today. Uh, we have over 100 employees and contractors that work for us. Our headquarters are in Fort Worth, Texas. And a lot of the folks are like me, sort of on their second career with just boodles of experience 20, 30 years of experience in the utility industry. But my favorite sort of part about working for Surtrek, if I can get it to come up, there it is. So uh, if you remember back in uh, many moons ago, 
the saying for IBM used to be, hey, you know, no one gets fired for buying IBM. We like to say, right, if you contract with Sirtrek, right, uh, zero fines. That's pretty exciting. And that's a real testament to the, uh, the skills, the quality, and the experience of the folks who work with us. So security, very hot topic, right? That's from the Department of Under, Understated Department, right? It didn't take very long to pull this slide together. Quick Google on security and utilities enabled me to, to pull the slide together in about 30 seconds, so, right? So it's totally top of mind. And of course, we're here today because you don't want to make those headlines right, for the wrong reasons for your organization. So it is a top of mind topic. Uh, within the utility space, both physical and cyber security. Uh, what's the most amazing uh, statistic on this chart for me is that there are 3% of the respondents out of 500 who said it's not important at all. So, right, it, important, somewhat important, you expect it to be near 90 or above 3%. That means about six people responded, and I think that's kind of wild. So, uh, and even if you look at the other sort of topics that came up, security is top of mind. So just a short shout out here to the NERC SIP 14 standard. While we will not be going into detail of that today, I'm sure there are people out there that are well versed in this one. I mean, it does cover transmission stations, transmission substations, and the primary control centers. And you can read the purpose there. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that we can help together bring physical security uh, and uh, intelligence, what's going on out to the perimeter of these uh, different, either the assets or the asset areas. Uh, but most importantly is sort of the, uh, the last bullet, if you will, that I've highlighted. What we're going to show you today through ACELON is not a necessarily a standalone island of automation, if you will. The solution that you'll see today uh, can and has been integrated into a variety of different systems. So this is not something extra that gets layered on top. It can be part of your defense in depth, if you will. So highly integratable into your current um, approaches and your current systems that you're using. All right, let's see if we get a transition here. I'll click again. There we go. So just a quick overview. Right, so the NERC SIP 14 sort of covers the substations, the transmission stations and the operating systems, uh, operating centers, obviously a lot of other areas that require attention from a physical security perspective, including gen sites, battery storage, and remote, uh, remote sites. What I thought was really interesting, why I wanted to put this slide up, was that the original projections for Right, just substations, transmission stations, and operating centers were supposed to be 500 sites that might um, fall under the standard, but under further review, right, that number is closer to 1,500. But a lot of organizations, a lot of aspects of the bulk electrical system that require a lot of attention from the, from the perspective of physical security. So some potential use cases. Uh, to, you know, just food for thought. And the reason we reached out to a lot of people in a lot of different parts of the utility uh, infrastructure, obviously, as I've mentioned mate, on the left, major substations and gen sites, which also include um, renewables, solar, uh, potentially wind, hydro, but also in other aspects of the utility industry, which includes the water treatment plant, um, the energy storage sites, and even remote sites. Now I have asterisks there for remote hydro and underground storage. Uh, it all depends, as you'll see, that um, the solution requires some sort of cellular connectivity, and Michael will cover that in more detail. So I, I just have that sort of just point that out, because um, I did deal with um, when I was calling on utilities in Canada, they'd say, we're interested in these types of solutions, but we don't even have cell coverage up there. So that, that presents somewhat of a challenge. Uh, also on the new construction side, potential laydown yards, things like that, or even decommissioning sites, right? Here's the opportunity to have um, perimeter patrols uh, where you don't necessarily have the man 24 seven. And what else do we have? Supply yards, I toured a supply yard where all the, the wires 
all the different types of um, transformers, both distribution transformers, things like that. Um, dispatch yards where your truck rolls occur from. Lots of different places where you might consider having physical security where potentially you either cannot get them staffed up or there might be, it might be cost prohibitive. And last slide. So now, as I mentioned, about two thirds of the participants here are from the nuclear industry. Um, give yourself a pat on the back, right? If you look at the quote there at the bottom, the most secure of nations, critical infrastructure, uh, your feedback today is gonna be really uh, important to us to understand what role potentially where robotics, drones, and AI could play in your already, right? Your defensive depth, which is um, well thought through and obviously critical to the operation of your um, sites. So what you have to tell us today is, is, you know, we're listening. We want to hear what you have to say with respect to the applicability of the technology for your organizations. And then lastly, a uh, quick public service announcement. As I was going through and studying um, the applicability of, of this type of technology for the utilities industry, I came across this document. You might want to do a quick screen snap here. Outstanding sets of checklists with regards to um, things to think about as you go through and create your physical security plan. So I thought it was a really good resource. And if uh, you're interested, um, please, again, do grab a quick uh, shot of this and go ahead and look that up if you aren't familiar with it already. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael from Asalon, and he will take us the, uh, through the exciting part of the discussion. Michael? Thank you, Drew. And good morning, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Michael Lichko. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Asalon. And um, <clears throat> I am going to share my screen. So we're going to jump back to that same uh, deck, but I'm going to be able to drive a little bit here for my side. So I'm going to do a quick AV check here. And um, you tell me, Drew, are you able to see that first slide? That's an affirmative. <clears throat> All right, great. Um, so a little bit about me. I uh, really come from the physical security technology world. Um, I spent the better part of 10 years working with national integrators, enterprise end users, um, specifying and deploying uh, physical security technology systems and the backend infrastructure. So really physical security is, is very much, um, you know, kind of my core competency and background. And, you know, ultimately, um, as I joined uh, the company and, and really you see the founding team right here, Damon, Adam and Brent, who were all aeronautical engineers, um, really our company is a marriage of this kind of physical security and, um, you know, mechanical, electrical and really aviation engineering um, know-how. Um, and so, you know, really, when you get into a little bit of the background of our company, um, founded in 2015, um, really the primary problem set that Damon, Adam, and Brent um, were really kind of working through as they, um, you know, they all graduated from MIT together. They all went into the DOD um, contractor space, but um, really saw a big need to be able to help automate the function of small UAS systems. And so, you know, if you go back to that, you know, kind of uh, mid to, uh, you know, mid <clears throat> 2000 aughts and, you know, 2010, you know, drones were definitely the rage and everybody was building drones and using them for hobby activities and inspections and photography and all that type of stuff, but very, very much reliant on having operators in the field uh, to, you know, basically you know, uncrate the actual drone to prepare it for a launch to recharge batteries and um, and ultimately to be standing there with kind of a remote in their hands and control it. Um, and 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 again, their 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 idea, their light bulb was really to say, look, you know, there's there's going to be a need for infrastructure to really automate and remote operate these types of systems. And so when you get into our core technology, um, the base station and the back end software that we developed to um, remote operate small UAS really off the shelf systems is what really started us as a company. And over the course of the first few years, um, we then developed our own drone airframe. It's a cl uh, class one quadcopter, about 20 pounds. Um, it's currently going through um, type certification with the FAA. Um, but that was our full stack solution, which we call Drone Century. And we began deploying those on um, commercial. Um, 
industrial sites, factories, warehouses, campuses, um, being a, a augment to the physical security um, technology and really the personnel teams, right? A lot of security officers there. And while we've been doing that, we also have been working very closely with the Department of Defense and primarily the US Air Force in basically taking what we'd already built and making kind of you know developments and modifications and really adding things to our technology roadmap that are specific to what the needs are gonna be for base protection when it comes to um, the US Air Force in particular. And it really was, through the course of um, you know a handful of those different projects that the Air Force came to us and said, you know, we've been evaluating these ground-based systems and you know we're looking at four-wheel systems, we're looking at track-based systems. Um, and really this quadruped, this robotic dog, um, really is the best, you know, kind of mousetrap for us, right? It really gives us the mobility to go to all the places within our property and even outside of our property that. Um, we really can't get to with these other types of robots. And in many times, these are places we don't want to go with our personnel. And so they effectively um, commissioned us to then you know, create modifications to our platform to then integrate with some of these third party systems. And so that's really what kind of brings us to um, kind of our current stance today, where we have our drone century platform, which is all full Acelon technology, hardware and software, all developed and manufactured in Philadelphia. And our drone dog system, um, which very much meets the same criteria, except just kind of, you know, pull the dog out of the equation. And, you know, we've partnered with um, what is, you know, obviously a, 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 you know, huge player in the robotics space, Boston Dynamics, uh, leveraging their spot platform, which has, you know, upwards of 20 years of R&D and refinement to it. And if you've ever seen one in person, they are incredibly impressive to, um, you know, how well and um, how functional they've gotten. So um, we've de been deploying both of these systems now for commercial security applications and also developing in parallel effectively the DOD kind of, you know, acceptable version of all this technology, um, really with the idea of getting to this idea of robotic perimeter security. And so, you know, when you get into this, you know, concept, for lack of a better term, um, you know, the primary function of these robots is to be a visible presence of security and to be a deterrence for the security team and for the posture of the facility itself and to be providing you know highly mobile hd and thermal camera feeds um, to do patrolling inspection surveillance uh, monitoring of security and safety events obviously a very kind of you know dynamic and um, easy to respond with tool that can be operated and monitored from an operation center. And so, you know, that that again really gets to kind of the crux of what um, we're doing in the market with drones and with robotic dogs is providing the ability for these to be brought into the operation center, um, you know, primarily to be out there patrolling, but then through software integrations, which our platform is very much optimized for, to be able to integrate with existing, you know, building systems, intrusion systems, alarm systems, so that as, you know, the patrol is kind of the primary function, if and when an alarm goes off, then the robotic platform has, you know, immediate notification that there is a situation happening and either can divert to go and put eyes on whatever um, area or wherever zone or whatever alarm um, device is actually firing off at that time. Um, to then provide that live stream so that, you know, within a matter of minutes, you can have, you know, HD and thermal eyes on a situation and assess and then respond accordingly. And so, you know, this is this is very much what, you know, this technology is, is has been geared and optimized for. And while it's still new technology and it is still, you know, really at kind of an early stage um, of, of development where, you know, we're, we're really hyper-focused on the automation of how the robots are moving around sites. Um, you know, the analytic piece is, is, is being kind of layered on top of that so that as you have drones and dogs that are effectively able to patrol and roam around your site um, with minimal human oversight or, um, you know, kind of navigation, you know, command and control, 
that you have analytic capabilities to also, you know, add some automated analysis to that. So um, very much meant to be kind of a foundational platform that will continue to get built upon, um, you know, over really the coming months and years. And so, you know, while we're still in the early days of deploying these systems, um, you know, when I kind of pulled our, our, um, our kind of fleet uh, performance from the last few years, um, you know, we've patrolled over 20,000 miles with our dogs on commercial security sites. We've performed over 40,000 um, security surveillance missions with our drones, and we're adding systems on a monthly basis. So those numbers just continue to increase um, almost exponentially, um, which really means, you know, the data, the experience, and ultimately even the ability to kind of feed into, you know, backend AI and machine learning um, to really continue to automate all this stuff um, is, is just growing um, tremendously, really. Um, so the one slide I kind of skipped over here gets a little bit into the business case of these systems. Um, you know, I always say it's definitely not apples to apples looking at a robot versus, you know, a human security officer. And we know that the majority of, you know, NERC and SIP compliant sites um, really don't have the flexibility to kind of repurpose personnel. But, you know, ultimately business cases kind of come down to, hey, how much do the robots cost versus, you know, the humans? And this is where, you know, we see on the low end of the spectrum for um, observe and report guards, um, you know, these types of numbers being dedicated to just the single kind of 24 seven, you know, post. Um, and, you know, the ability of the robots to come in and provide a whole lot of that, you know, observe and report functionality and then add layers of technology with integrations and analytics and thermal eyes and all these types of things um, and do so many times at, you know, um, a pretty good discount to what these numbers are, um, obviously, is what's really driving a lot of adoption in the commercial space. So, you know, something we're you know more than happy to kind of dive into on an individual basis. Um, if anybody's interested in really kind of parsing through numbers. Um, but a big piece of what we're doing with this technology as well that I think is unique in the marketplace is that we're really wrapping it all in a in a fully managed field services um, kind of comprehensive um, contract, right? And so as opposed to just kind of handing over a drone or handing over a dog and kind of training people up and then walking away, um, you know, at this stage of adoption, there still is, you know, a lot of expertise required. There's a lot of, you know, facilities that really haven't utilized these types of technologies before, although, you know, this sector definitely is on the more advanced side of doing inspection with drones and and even, you know, with, with robotic dogs, obviously Boston Dynamics um, is, you know, very, very much utilized in a lot of industrial inspection. Um, but when you want the systems to be running 24 seven and they need to be available to kind of match that security posture and use case, um, you know, ultimately it's, you know, at this stage, we think kind of best to be allowing someone to come in that's doing it on a daily basis. It's already done 40,000 missions and 20,000 miles to really be the point people for that. Um, really with an effort to um, kind of customize what these implementations look like within an enterprise and within an actual site um, with an effort to ultimately be able to hand these things off, you know, a little bit down the line. So, um, you know, again, these are kind of site by site organization by organization type conversations and details. Um, it's definitely not a one size fits all, but something that, you know, this is our starting point with how we look to implement the technology. And then depending on, you know, who we're working with, then, you know, we kind of create plans um, for transitioning um, to either, you know, local facility folks or even, you know, third party folks, depending on um, how the organization manages some of their security services. So, um, again, something that, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into, but, you know, the goal there is really, you know, kind of continuity of service. And we want to make sure that everything is accounted for. Um, what I'm really tracking towards in this deck here, I've only got a few more slides and then I'm going to log into our drone iq software platform and actually pull up some missions that you can see what it looks like when we have a drone in the air and we have a dog on the ground and kind of what the command center view looks like for all this kind of technology but before we get to that point i just want to kind of give you some visuals as to what these systems really are and what they're doing so you know when we kind of break down all the components we obviously have the drone which we call drone century uh, we have the dog which is a combination of the boston dynamic spot unit with Acelon proprietary, you know, we call it the pup pack, our payload that we bolt on top of spot that gives us complete command and control of the unit through our software platform. 
Um, and then the base stations. So drone home is what we developed for the drone. Um, we've got some you know, moving pictures here in the next few slides so you see what these look like in person. Um, and then obviously the doghouse is um, you know, intended for the, uh, uh, for the drone dog unit. Uh, with really Drone IQ being our proprietary software that is um, really kind of a, a hybrid of command and control, system programming, API integration, live video viewing, video archiving, all the functionality that you're really looking for from a software component um, comes from Drone IQ. Uh, but this is also where um, you know we're doing this both in the commercial space and definitely in the in the um, federal DoD space where you know we're 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 integrating up into higher level systems common operating platforms you know being able to provide video footage telemetry um and even and and, and even in some in some of our plans um and roadmaps right the ability to even kind of maybe push some command and control into those platforms but then we're also integrating down where we're obviously utilizing our hardware third-party hardware um we have our own analytics but we're also leveraging third-party analytics really trying to you know not be a a catch-all you know closed proprietary system but more so be open platform and really trying to leverage um, best in class depending on what the kind of component technology might be and ultimately what um, the end result is that we're trying to accomplish in the field but um, again drone iq is that kind of central nervous system for us and when we really look at the hardware so as I log into the system and we talk through um, what these missions look like, right? This is the actual equipment that's generating all of that. So um, in the event of our drone dog platform, you see obviously a base station on the left. Um, we've basically taken the Boston Dynamics charging dock, which is what the dog is resting on and standing up and exiting for its tour um, and created an environmentally kind of sealed HVAC controlled outdoor enclosure um, that really has a pretty simple deployment. It needs just a 20 amp outlet to be able to plug into. And then we provide localized LTE so that we have the ability to dial into the station and the enclosure itself. While the payload that you see on top of the dog there on the right provides command and control and LTE connectivity um, so that our HD and thermal payload that's mounted onto the front basically captures whatever data is happening in real time um, and pushes it straight up to the cloud where then everything is kind of accessed and utilized within our um, drone iq cloud platform when we look at our drone platform the aerial drone platform um, the base station is a little bit bigger obviously we have a landing deck and we have um, a patented battery swapping system that you see in this gif right here um, which really enables us to take what has typically been a pretty big issue with um, you know small UAS systems, which is you have a limited runtime, right? You're typically 20 to 30 minutes in runtime for one of these quadcopters. But then that battery, if you're really kind of following the directions, you know, definitely may take up to 45 or 60 minutes to recharge itself. And so, you know, in a, in a security application, that's just way too much downtime. And we have a, um, and this was again, one of, a, one of the core technologies that we really developed going back to 2015. Um, basically a half a dozen battery bays in that electronics kit that gives us the ability to always have fully charged batteries ready to go. And our swapping system will basically take a drone from a cold start and, and populate it with a fresh battery and launch it in the air in um, three minutes. And so making it, you know, very responsive, but also very nimble to be able to perform, you know, back-to-back -back missions in the event that, you know, there's, there's kind of an extended um, need to be out and covering some type of situation, security event, whatever it might be. Um, but you know, you see on the right what some of the visuals are that it generates. And you know, anybody here that's that's flown a drone or utilize it either for you know for fun or for you know for for work purposes, you know, having having a highly mobile and control at your fingertips, you know, HD thermal camera is is obviously a game changer, right? I mean, this this is just capabilities and a vantage point on facilities that just really hasn't existed before. And so, you know, depending on the site and depending on what it is we're trying to accomplish with these systems, um, you know, the drone brings a huge increase in capabilities. Um, you know, ultimately, drones our aircraft. And so that's where, you know, when we're looking at the overall mission and what we're trying to do on a daily, if not even an hourly basis, 
Um, you know, there's going to be some factors you just have to account for in the form of, you know, adverse weather and, you know, site by site FAA restrictions, depending on where you're located relative to a um, an airport um, or even, you know, when we get into, you know, critical infrastructure designations. Right. You know, there's definitely no fly zones and, you know, other certain types of restrictions on, you know, very high value critical infrastructure facilities. So, you know, all things that come into consideration. But. Um, something that the ACELON team, as we, again, kind of deliver this as a service wrap, um, that, you know, we provide all that expertise on behalf of our customers. And so, you know, a lot of our commercial customers don't already have their own drone or UAS or aviation teams. Um, a lot of the people in this room, I'm sure, do, you know, as far as their organizations go. And so that's where, you know, collaborating before, you know, back and forth between these organizations um, is is obviously very, very important. But um, we actually hold the you know highest number of individual BV loss um, approvals across um, seven or eight sites with um, our customers of any drone service provider in the country. Um, our drone is going through type certification right now, and we're also seeing some um, some positive kind of changes and and streamlining happening at the FAA level as far as commercial drone regulations go for, you know, unattended, unmanned, you know, beyond visual line of sight operations that, you know, we're, we're very optimistic that we're getting very, very close to having an environment where we can deploy a drone and configure it, you know, fill out the proper paperwork and ultimately be able to walk away from it and just, you know, be able to remote operate as opposed to still having to be, you know, tethered by having people on site that are kind of responsible for, you know, all the different safety requirements that the FAA puts on drones, um, you know, on day one. So, again, you know, very much its own kind of wormhole and something we're more than happy to kind of dive into. Um, but, you know, a lot of the answers to those questions very much depend on, you know, your particular site. So, um, but as we're kind of tracking to the end here, you know, drone IQ, I'll, I'll, I'll really get more into when we're in the um, in the software itself. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, we are providing this kind of remote operation kind of service wrap to everything. Um, really, this was, um, you know, kind of a requirement by the FAA, as we are the people that are you know, fulfilling and, and, and responsible for all the FAA compliance on our commercial sites effectively that locks us into becoming the operator of the system. So we have a 24 seven operation center staffed by, you know, FAA certified pilots and obviously ASIL and technology certified operators. Um, you know, this requirement, um, you know, likely won't go away anytime in the near future. Um, there definitely are some organizations that have very developed UIS groups and capabilities that you know, ultimately could be probably the the first candidates for the FAA to allow us to kind of hand control over to one of our drone systems to a company like that. Um, but frankly, you know, at this point, there really isn't a great line of sight to that. So, you know, the expectation that we kind of set here with customers is that, you know, we'll likely have to be, you know, involved in that operation in some form or fashion um, to maintain compliance um, on the drone side. Um, the dogs were, were kind of operating in a similar way, but it's really out of just good practice. And so as, you know, we've we've only deployed the dogs for these security applications really about 18 months ago, um, you know, there was a lot that we didn't know. There was very much a lot that our customers didn't know. And we found it best for us to just kind of maintain that, you know, kind of direct contact with the system so that, um, you know, we can monitor and maintain, you know, the integrity of what's happening and we can troubleshoot on the fly if needed. Uh, but more so, you know, it's really helping us to create SOPs that, you know, from our vantage point, are really intended to um, establish, hey, how do you actually ingest a drone into your security operation? Or how do you ingest a dog into your security operation? And, you know, what do you do with the actual data that's coming in? Um, so, you know, when we deploy new systems, we work with customers at a site level to basically create a very detailed SOP document, which you see me just kind of scrolling through here, um, really with the idea of accounting for all the details from, you know, lines of contact, lines of communication, points of contact to, you know, ultimately even from a monitoring perspective, you know, what are the different types of issues that may occur and what do we do when we actually, you know, discover or, or identify them in real time when we're out performing patrols. And so, you know, this is, this is very much how we're doing things today. 
And really, this is kind of a giving us the ability to kind of templatize this information so that when we do have a customer that we're going to kind of implement and hand systems off to, right, we've already really kind of created a blueprint. And so, you know, in many ways, these obviously get, you know, changed and edited and customized customer by customer and site by site. But, you know, we've, we've definitely done enough of these at this point to see a whole lot of common areas and things that, you know, say, okay, this is really the best way to go about it. And so, you know, this is just another aspect of what we do from a kind of deployment, really kind of pre-deployment support perspective. So, um, you know, definitely talking with Drew and the folks at Surtrack, you know, we're very cognizant that the, um, you know, really just like the ability for, you know, a nuclear facility or even a SIP, um, you know, compliant facility um, to have this type of like third party managed service coming into their environment, you know, may not be something that's easy to approve, you know, if at all. Um, and this is where, you know, we really see from a timeline perspective, you know, um, on our on our drone dog side, we're likely about six to maybe 12 months from really, I think, kind of having enough data and enough experience in the field to kind of properly say, okay, if you want to take control of this from day one, then this is how you do it. And, you know, that's it's a combination of obviously training, it's a combination of SOPs, and it's a combination of, you know, kind of back end support. And so, you know, if, if that is kind of a hard requirement within your organization, right, um, you know, ultimately starting to just parse through this information and look at this through the prism of an actual site deployment um, is stuff that I think really kind of starts now to kind of properly prepare yourself for, okay, you know, how do we actually ingest this and utilize it within, you know, our own four walls um, in the near future here. So um, again, something that, you know, between ourselves and the folks at Surtrack, more than happy to kind of dive into these individual conversations um, outside of the event here and outside of the show. Um, but as really just kind of the last um, slide that I want to touch on here is, you know, integrations, right? Um, this is something I think our, our, our platform is, is, you know, very much at a lead point in the market for, which is, you know, our ability to work within the existing, you know, facility environment and, you know, leverage existing systems. So these are just examples on the screen here between our DOD efforts and our commercial efforts as to where customers have us, you know, interconnecting with, with different types of systems. Um, some to be able to pull alarms and alert, uh, alarms and alerts out to utilize for real time, you know, um, alarm response and others, you know, pushing, you know, data from our platform in so that, you know, they can leverage it amongst all the other systems that they're doing and monitoring on kind of a daily basis. So, um, so anyway, more than happy to kind of talk through any of that stuff, but, um, you know, that really is kind of the, uh, um, the high level overview here from, from the deck perspective. So, um, at this point, I'm going to log over to drone IQ and just show you a couple of missions. And really, at this point, um, you know, once I kind of go through a few things here, I think Drew would be able to kind of open up the Q and A here. But um, you know, when you log into Drone IQ, this is a browser-based user interface. Um, you know, we host everything through Google Cloud, but you know, ultimately, we're working with the DoD um, for air gap solutions for this type of you know, um, you know, more more high security deployment, kind of offline deployment. Um, we are also. Um, gearing up for CMMC um, compliance with the DOD. So, you know, a lot of our DOD workflow that's playing out right now, um, I think probably very much aligns this with what the requirements are for, you know, some of these more um, secure critical infrastructure facilities. Um, we are operating um, with a, uh, a large utility um, out west, really doing pilots right now with, um, with both systems to kind of understand where the best fit is with the dogs and the drones um, really across substations, generation facilities, um, and potentially even transmissions facilities. So um, something that you know we are gaining more and more experience with here in this field, and um, you know ultimately kind of applies across the board with everybody that we are working with. So, um, but when we log in, we we see a dashboard view. This will just kind of give you a summary of you know operations and activities that are happening at your sites. Um, all of this obviously is kind of, um, you know, customized by, you know, user account authorizations and access. So there's kind of a master admin and then we can, we can administer different types of um, informational access to what's in drone IQ user by user. Um, this is the section here, mission planner, that we create these pre-programmed missions. 
And so here, if we're looking at, and actually I'm gonna back back out and we'll look at a drone mission here first. So if we look at how we create a pre-programmed automated drone mission, um, you know, this is this is kind of what the map looks like. So we have a primary green geofence that restricts the drone from leaving that area, no matter what we try to do from a pre-programmed or even from a free fly perspective, right? It, it will literally, you know, restrict and geofence that drone inside those walls. Um, we can also create, you know, um, exclusion zones and, and kind of sub restricted zones inside that. Uh, but then really when it comes to the path, we're just dropping waypoints on the map We're we're configuring certain details at each waypoint. And then we're also providing area of interest points so that as we create this sequential route, we can pepper in um, where we want the camera to actually be focused and looking so that we can really try to automate, you know, nearly all if, you know, if not all of the function of the drone so that, you know, you're, you're now just kind of, you know, generating the video and the data that you want, which you can have an analytic running over, you can have somebody monitoring it. Um, you know, but really kind of making sure that it's really just a hands off actual operation of the system. And so, you know, again, this is very much what we're doing um, on the ground as well with the dogs. And so, you know, GPS waypoint. Now, you know, we always kind of say that, you know, putting a robot on a, on a waypoint mission in the air is, you know, way less risky than doing it on the ground, um, namely because there really shouldn't be anything else up in the air with us while we're up there flying. But we're on the ground, you know, you can see this is a large logistics facility here. You know, there's there's trucks, there's vehicles, there's there's forklifts, there's people, you know, there, there could be a whole lot of potential of, you know, just things that could get in the way of the robot. And so while there is localized sense and avoid on the dog itself, that is really, really effective at avoiding static objects. Um, you know, if something's moving faster than the dog, then ultimately, you know, it's going to be, you know, uh, you know, potential for a collision, something like that. So um, this is where, you know, we've, we've pushed this capability out into the field and kind of on a site by site basis, we're really starting to you know, do risk analysis as to, okay, you know, for these types of patrols at this time of day, you know, do we have a, you know, a relatively safe environment to put the dog on its own waypoint mission? Or do we want to have somebody that's a little bit more in control and making real-time decisions from a navigational perspective, um, where we have remote teleoperation capability um, that's inherent with that payload that we bolt on the spot? Um, but again, the goal is to really just configure these routes and, you know, provide a, a regular and varied patrol capability, and then also have the ability at a moment's notice to respond to an alarm. And so this is where, you know, we have a, you know, alarm programming layer um, at this particular site. We're tied into their Bosch access control panels. And, you know, in real time, we receive the alarms. We have a few filters to be able to filter out alarms that maybe don't apply to the dog. But, you know, the, the, the goal here really is to be as, as, as kind of tied into the day-to-day -day operation of the site as possible. Um, so we have a live ops view. This is typically what you would see um, up, in, at, at, up at the actual security desk or potentially, you know, um, within the GSOC up on the video wall. Um, you know, you see at this particular site, we actually have three robots. We have, we have two dogs, one on the north side, one on the south side, and then we do have a drone system here as well. Um, and this really kind of is a good example of like the progression of, you know, how, how customers are, are really adopting and implementing this technology. So this site started as a drone deployment. Um, it was providing a huge increase in capabilities. It was giving them, you know, the ability to see all around the property um, really at a moment's notice. And this is a site where they very much have been, you know, gravitating towards automating as much as the exterior function of the building as, as possible. So, you know, points of entry, gate entry for trucks, personnel entry, um, you know, the ultimate inspection, the ability for, you know, them to put eyes on, um, you know, fence lines, on door locks, doing door checks, just kind of maintaining the integrity of the security of the building, um, while also having the ability to, you know, respond at a moment's notice. And so, you know, the drone was really effective, but, you know, there were times where it couldn't fly, right? You had, you know, fog or you had, you know, bad weather, you had really high winds, whatever that might be. 
And so to diversify a little bit, when we brought our dog um, system kind of online, right, we deployed a dog there to be really the primary patrol tool. And, you know, that kind of opened everybody's eyes up to saying, oh, wow, if we have multiple robots and two types of robots, right, that kind of have different strengths and weaknesses, but all tying back to a common platform, you know, this, this, is, this is really a powerful tool now. And so in this particular site, because it was so big, we actually added a second dog house just so we could extend the path of where the dog could patrol to. And once they saw the dog getting to the south side of the property on a regular basis, you know, there's like, hey, just give us another dog, right? At this point, we see the value on having kind of a north zone and a south zone. Um, you know, so, you know, for this particular site, it was a little bit of an evolution as to how we got to this final implementation. But, you know, from our vantage point, depending on, again, what we're trying to accomplish, you know, having, you know, multiple assets and having kind of an air and a ground component, um, you know, really is kind of just really in line with with traditional security, which is layers, right? None of this stuff is meant to be a silver bullet. None of it is going to solve all your problems on its own, uh, but it's really best utilized, you know, in concert with everything else. So, uh, so, but from there, Drew, I'll, I'll kind of throw back to you or, you know, throw it out to, to questions here. And I'm just going to kind of keep pulling up some, some video footage that people can watch while we talk through this, but, um, you know, definitely happy to take some questions. Yeah. I appreciate uh, the presentation, Michael. So we have had a couple of questions. One of them, first one uh, was about environmental specs. I responded to that in the chat also, um, also by putting the link to the Boston Dynamics uh, robot specification sheet. If there are further questions about the environmental capabilities, um, please put them in the chat. I'm happy to respond to them. The next set of questions comes from um, David. And I'm going to let Asalon respond to that. If you can see those, I can either read them off or you can, uh, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me see. I don't know. Just yeah. click chat. See so you go down. So, first one about on site requirements and things like that. Um, honestly, if you could read it off, I. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, first one is Are there any on site requirements besides for the docking station for the drones, radar, cameras, et cetera, for the remote BVLOS operations? That's the first mm -hmm. one. No, great question. So, yeah, the dog is obviously very simple and straight away, you just need power. The drone system, um, the base station needs power. Um, we can take a network connection or we can provide an LTE backhaul there. Um, and then for the BV loss, absolutely. So um, effectively what we're doing from a waiver perspective um, includes having a localized camera to be able to do visual inspection of the drone itself. And then you do need to detect and avoid system, which um, in all likelihood is a radar. You know, There's been a little bit of precedent for people using um, acoustical systems. And I think there may have been somebody that got a camera system um, approved, but um, we're really pursuing the ground-based radar as being that primary detect and avoid. Um, system. And that's actually something that we have. Um, currently, I think we have seven overall approvals for beyond visual line of sight. Um, they're, low, they're, they're actually kind of incremental. So building on the fact of taking um, the designation of the pilot in control being the person in the field to actually the person in our ops center, um, and then giving them the ability to fly at night and fly over buildings, um, or I'm sorry, fly over people and fly over vehicles. And right now we're going through and getting our um, approvals for the radar to be um, ultimately the DAA system. And then I feel like that there's been a recent kind of standardization about the actual visual inspection piece. So um, that was really going to be our last gate to get to fully unmanned. But um, that may have already been kind of, um, you know, answered for by the FAA. So uh, but anyway, yeah, long answer short. Um, those are those are the components. OK, the second part of that. If we had, if we already, <clears throat> excuse me, have spot robots, can they be utilized within your platform? I think I know the answer, but I'll let you handle that, Michael. Absolutely. So when we get into um, existing kind of spot applications, we have quite a few customers that have already kind of, you know, taken advantage of this, right? A lot of people went out and bought spot units to do inspections. And um, a lot of people thought they could use it for security. And then once they got it out into the field, they realized it was still very labor intensive to kind of keep the dog moving. And so, yes, as long as it's a spot enterprise unit, um, which is what is able to marry up to the docking charging station, um, then we can basically retrofit that dog, right? So we can come in, we can basically just bolt our, our, our pup pack onto it. 
Um, if you already have a charging dock, we can use that and kind of install it into an enclosure, or we could just, you know, supply that as well. Uh, but really, yeah, we can come in and, and provide all this capability with an existing dog um, and are more than willing to do so, right? That's 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 something on our end, you know, we don't really care where the dog comes from, frankly. <laughs> yeah, the caveat, though, is, of course, you would have to, if you had a spot cam on there, that would have to come off. The pup pack um, takes up the real estate on the back of the spot. No, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. anybody that's using spot today um, to use it within our platform, um, yeah, you would have to basically commit to using our payload. Um, we also do have an option because um, we do have folks that are using Spot. They're using Scout. Um, they want an enclosure. Um, we can actually basically, you know, hand over. You know, I would call it a dumb enclosure. It basically doesn't include our drone IQ, anything like that. But but it does give you all the functionality of having remote operated enclosure um, that you can remotely operate. So that is kind of a a lower tier option that we have as well. If anyone's interested. Okay, so we've got a few more. So um, again, from David, and I'm anxious to hear the answer to this one. Any support for ghost robotics? And similarly, is there a reason that Boston Dynamics Dog is preferred to ghost robotics? Um, yeah, I mean, we actually performed the original um, Air Force contract with Ghost. And so that's where, you know, our initial proof of concept and, and kind of prototype for all this stuff was actually in a Ghost unit. So um, we very much are you know kind of agnostic when it comes to the hardware um, we haven't deployed anything with ghost simply because when we were looking at kind of our commercial market footprint and we were already um, getting into some very big scalable customers with our drone system you know just the back end development resources support everything that boston dynamics has versus ghost you know we we kind of elected to go that route um, so, you know, but ultimately, hey, if you've standardized your facility, you know, on, on ghost dogs, then, you know, we can definitely sit and have that conversation. Excellent. Uh, so I'll answer the last one out of order. So any nuclear power plants using this technology. So uh, spot is ubiquitous in the nuclear power industry for RP usage, radiation protection use cases. It is not, uh, it has not yet been deployed. I believe in the Acelon environment, uh, in the security use case. And similarly, the question is, you know, what is the NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission response on acceptance of this technology? You know, when I was at Boston Dynamics, we did not submit it to the NRC, and I don't believe Acelon has, but I'll let you kind of just uh, um, make any comments on that, Michael. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, short answer is no, we haven't, we haven't deployed on a nuke side yet. We're actually going through with the utility, um, it kind of one of these circumstances where they bought a spot. Um, they have an actual, um, inspection, a storage kind of facility inspection that they want to do. But right now they've got to send a bunch of personnel with an actual security escort to get to where these items are to go and do what is basically a three to four hour inspection. And so we're actually looking to kind of bolt our, our remote operational capability and put a station up on that rooftop um, to make it all remote operated. Um, so that's probably our nearest um, term application that, that would kind of get close to nuclear. Um, we're also very much working with, um, you know, some of the nuclear supply arsenal with, with the U.S. Air Force at a couple of bases as well, um, by not being one of them. So um, not deployed yet, but definitely working with these folks very closely. Okay. Other questions? Got a, another couple minutes here. Um, while we're waiting for any other questions, uh, Michael, maybe you could just talk a little bit about system reliability, support, and service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, we've we've done over 40,000 drone missions. Um, we provide, you know, localized field support. So, you know, we have SLAs with our customers for um, you know, remote support as well as on-site um, support. Um, we are also um, finishing up our next version of the base station, which really takes all the lessons learned from those 40,000 missions from a reliability standpoint, as well as a few additional new capabilities, and is basically creating that next version that's going out that, again, is really meant to be able to fully support these, um, you know, the regulatory kind of, you know, gate opening that we're going to see here. Um, on the dog side, um, we've been really, really impressed with the reliability of the dog itself. In those 20,000 miles that we've patrolled, I think we've had maybe six or so actual hardware failures that required the dog to come out of service. 
Um, and in those instances, um, what we do, and this is, I think, the benefit of the Acelon service wrap is, you know, that dog has to go back to Boston. They've got a 10 day turnaround time by by their own warranty um, SLAs. And so when we know something's going to, you know, is going to go out of service for a week or more, we actually ship in a replacement and we just bolt on, you know, we bolt on that same pup back and we put a dog back into service so that we can, you know, get that kind of security site back up and running, you know, with minimal downtime in relation to having to go and, you know, ship things across the country and things like that. So, um, but ultimately that's, that's really hasn't happened a whole, you know, a whole lot at all. And then on our hardware side, for the dog, right? The station and the pup pack um, really have been pretty robust. The only things that we've really seen is, you know, when you patrol that many miles, the dog will fall over, right? There's just, there's no doubt about it. It'll, it'll, it'll slip, it'll hit a pothole, it'll fall down a stair, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, we've had a couple of big spills that required, you know, some, some service on the actual payload itself. Um, but again, pretty, pretty minimal considering how much we've been out there. I mean, you know, I think by our standards, everything is kind of at like a percent or less as far as service goes. Yeah. Service out goes. Yeah. Yep. So in the last two minutes, we have a couple more questions came in. So from David, will your system generate alerts for smoke and fire? Um, not today, but it will. So, you know, right now we have classifiers for people and vehicles that are already pushed out to the field. There's object tracking on this camera itself. You can see that crosshair. Um, we're, we're, we're basically implementing the software component of that alarm functionality now. Um, and then on the thermal side, um, we have that kind of behind, um, behind that release in development. But then we're also working with some third party folks that can provide, I think, a much shorter timeline to be able to have like an auto alert to a thermal anomaly. So if that was a hard requirement, I think we've got a solution we can kind of bring to the table for that. Awesome. And I'm gonna, we're going to have to go quick here. Um, this is a tough one to answer quickly, but what would be the cost to set up a typical small mission for, say, a generating facility? Uh, well, it really kind of depends on, you know, the the hours of operation. But, you know, if we're doing 24-7 operations with, you know, if we're talking about the dog, um, you know, I think you can kind of budget. It's going to come in around, you know, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen dollars an hour. Um, you know, for 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 our fully managed service, right? And so, you know, that that obviously includes our remote operations center and monitoring and things of that sort. Um, so, you know, depending on the site, you know, a single dog, single base station should cut it. Um, and then, you know, there'd be a little bit of 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 charge for cellular usage when it comes to the LTE. All right. And quick note on time. Um, I have time. I can stay on if we have more questions. So we're I not going to yeah, jump. So. Same as Michael. So if you got more questions, keep firing. And for those who have to jump, really appreciate your time and attention. But we're going to keep grinding away here. Um, and I will say, uh, if you have, for those who have to leave, um, it's drew.askinaz at uh, surcharge.com. And uh, we're happy to talk more. So let's let's keep going. So any integration capability with Mirian, thank you, uh, with Mirian AIM security system. Uh, not anything that we've worked on yet, but you know that's where we're we're kind of taking them as our customers bring them to us. So um, I would think the hardest part of any of these integration conversations is just figuring out the network component. Um, so once once we figure that out then, you know, the actual integration is, you know, relatively simple. I'm not going to call it easy by any means, but um, um, something that, yeah, I mean, that's just a component of our, you know, customer by customer conversations. So. Yeah. And you have a pretty substantial list of systems that you already integrate with. So obviously you've got a good background with that. So um, let's see. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Did uh, I think we had a question from Newscale early on on the environmental spe specifications? Did we provide the appropriate Absolutely. response for that? Um, no, 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 I don't think we did. So yeah, well, so environmentals well. on the dog system. Um, really, the dog is the um, I don't want to call it the weak point, right? But it's always you know <laughs> what, what is your you know least least robust part. So zero to 100 is effectively the temperature threshold, zero to, zero to 100 Fahrenheit um, for, for the dog. If we start getting much outside of that range, then we'll start to see some mechanical issues on the dog. Um, the payload in the dog house, you know, definitely exceed that. 
Um, from a rain perspective, um, the dog can get wet, but it can't get soaked today. Um, it's technically a IP54 equivalent, so it's a light rain condition. Um, but there is a pretty substantial upgrade um, that's really getting pushed out from their production facilities now that has increased their water ingress protection to you know, a substantial increase. So we haven't seen it out in the field yet. We have seen it in testing. And I mean, I've literally seen them blasting fire hoses at dogs and without the dog having any issues. So um, we'll see what it really does in the field. But um, yeah, that, that rain threshold should increase pretty substantially. Um, the drone, the primary weather, um, it's a, probably that similar temperature range. Um, obviously high winds, um, we, can, we, we can basically operate in 40 mile an hour winds and below. Um, so if we start getting into areas, which um, honestly, I've been amazed around the country, you know, areas that you wouldn't think that, you know, have, you know, 60 mile an hour winds for, you know, days on end. Um, but, um, you know, high winds and, um, you know, from a technical perspective, you know, we can fly in the rain, we can fly in the snow. Um, the FAA has a few things to say about that, right? So they're obviously very kind of resistant to people flying when you have low, you know, low cloud cover, when you have fog. Um, typically those things accompany, you know, kind of rain and snow. So, um, so some of that is a little bit out of our control, but, um, yeah, th I think those are kind of the primary environmental stats, if you will. And just to uh, add to that, I see a lot of people are still with us. So I guess it's okay to continue to try to add a little content here. So on, you know, pe people ask, what is the, uh, planned maintenance for the dog itself? I, I think the funny one is, uh, checking the treads. Right. I think you yeah. were the first customer to actually wear out treads on the dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that you... really, I was going to say, yeah, that really is the the only kind of scheduled or, you know, um, preventative maintenance that we've had on that system. Um, it just chews through the treads, depending on the site terrain. Um, the drone has far more of like a scheduled maintenance interval, right? So every, you know, every couple hundred hours, there's like a field service that happens to the drone you know, every 500 or 600 hours of flight time, the drone actually comes back and gets swapped with a different drone um, for, you know, larger reconditioning. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we've been seeing. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from, you can go live or in the chat. I know we're past time. Uh, if not, Okay, so let's do a quick wrap up. So this uh, webinar has been recorded. And so what we will do is we will put this webinar up on our YouTube channel. Uh, so people can either come back, review the content, or you can share it with other folks. And uh, we will have that up there probably, uh, what's today, Thursday, sometime early next week. Uh, we will make the slides available for those who are interested in, again, uh, reviewing the content. And of course, more importantly, we'd like to hear from you. So if this if this webinar hit the spot, awesome. If it didn't, we'd like to know more, especially on, you know, like I said, we had about 66%, two thirds participation was from the nuclear industry. We'd like to know, you know, where the gaps might be. And if necessary, we can kind of go in and try and um, close those gaps if possible. We would like to try and figure out how to make this technology available to you, as I mentioned in the slide, right year number one, uh, from a security and the critical infrastructure perspective. Uh, but hopefully that means you're also interested in innovation. So uh, again, we'd love to hear from you, no more. Uh, any closing thoughts from you, Michael? Um, well, really just, yeah, I wanna thank everybody for their time. I think that this particular, um, you know, kind of vertical, right, from my perspective, is very much in alignment with the level of security and things that we're doing and building on a daily basis for the DOD. So, um, you know, to your point there, right, if there are gaps or if there are just requirements, um, it's great for us to get better visibility of that. I think in all likelihood, they very much align with what we're already working on. But, um, you know, again, this is new technology, so it really starts with education. So, you know, we're always here to help educate and answer questions. And then, you know, wherever that leads, um, you know, we're all for it. So, uh, thanks for putting this together, Drew. We really appreciate it. Nope. And thanks for everyone coming here. Give the folks who um, attended, give yourself a round of applause. This was the number one webinar we've conducted this year. So I'm excited about that. It's a cool technology. I'm excited to be here. Um, and to the folks, you're very welcome. This is always fun. And Michael, thanks. Brandon, thanks. 
Uh, and we hope to hear from you all more. We want to do business with you. We're excited. Hope you yep. are too. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you.